Uh, I believe Regent Butker is listening in today. Um, uh, Rachel, does this group take a roll call? Um, start, start yeah, Jim, meeting? we we generally do, and I don't know. Did did I provide you a list for that, or do you, would you like yeah, me to help no, out? I, okay. Well, I have a list for the uh, academic affairs. I don't think I have one for the uh, campus and student affairs, but I, I'll call the roll call. Uh, roll call that uh, we were provided here, uh, starting with. Uh, uh, Associate Chief Academic Officer Pontius. Uh, present. Uh, Chief Academic Officer Boone. Present. Vice President Hansen. I think she's, she's right. present. She's, she's yeah, on she, mute. She did say present. Yeah. And Assistant Administrator Cool, I think, could not make it today. Vice President Knudsen. Vice President Younger. Here. Provost Kriegel. Present. Provost Walpart. Present. Provost Wickert. Present. Regent Least. Here. And Regent Lyndon Myers, present. So the first item of business is approval of our uh, Academic Affairs Committee meeting uh, minutes for November. Uh, you had a chance to review those, I think. Are there any changes? Okay, hearing none, uh, these will be approved by general consent. Um, and item two will be the same uh, uh, type of item minutes from the Campus and Student Affairs Committee from November. Are there any changes or notations there? Great, Hear, hearing none, those will be approved by general consent. Uh, the University of Iowa has a request for a new research center. Provost uh, Kriegel, can you speak to that please for us? Yes, I will, thank you, Regent Lindemeyer. So this is a request uh, primarily from the College of Nursing, but it's interdisciplinary in focus and it's a new center for advancing multimorbidity science. And the aim here is to take an interdisciplinary approach uh, that is really going to be focused on the complex multiple uh, chronic conditions that manifest in, in adult humans, especially in aging populations. And uh, the uh, expertise that we'll derive from uh, the campus is really gonna focus on the data and uh, data science and analytics approach to these kinds of conditions. And so a little background, uh, typically, uh, in a, especially in an aged population, an individual may uh, succumb to some type of life-threatening condition. Once uh, that's perhaps dealt with, treated, then there is a myriad of other multiple chronic conditions that seem to manifest. And so this is a new area that's really starting to um, evolve in terms of a, a precision health approach where there's expertise, there's a lot of data analysis to identify these different uh, complexes. And uh, so in this case, the center is really focused on bringing together expertise we have on campus from the College of Nursing, College of Education, our um, Institute for Clinical and Translational Science, Biostatistics. And so through this, and the, can the Holden Cancer Center. So through this complex integrated approach within the center, there'll be uh, an attempt to both uh, evaluate data, uh, analyze, do uh, some um, artificial intelligence type of approaches to try to start looking at how these complexes interact. And then certainly uh, on the other end of this process is to help with treatment uh, regimens in um, these patients. So it's really targeted towards um, developing knowledge, expertise that can help, especially in rural Iowa in patients who have these manifested conditions. And so that then the university can help impart and educate different um, caregivers in those kinds of scenarios. So the center is well established in terms of its expertise on campus already and has uh, funding established from the National Institute of Nursing Research at this point and they anticipate um, a lot of other 
extramural funding as they go forward with the study. So um, glad to answer any questions on that. Kevin, is there any need for to add additional staff here that uh, would not be covered by the funding? No, that the the College of Nursing has uh, been able to identify space in their building, and the staff and faculty are already in place. They have had some funding that's allowed them to hire to, to this point, and um, so should not be any need to hire or uh, provide any additional funding for the center to move forward at this point. Any, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, and are, are there any objections from the Academic Affairs Committee? Strong support from Northern Iowa. Great. Thanks, Jim. If there are no objections, the Academic Affairs Committee will recommend approval of the Center for Advancing Multimorbidity Science at the University of Iowa at a regular board meeting. Um, next item on the docket includes an update on the biennial review of the Regents Admissions Index. Chief, Chief Academic Officer Boone will present this update to us now. Thank you, Regent Lindenmeyer. And um, you've got a brief report in your docket that you've already been able to see. Um, and there are some of our subject matter experts uh, from the admissions world are on the call with us today and they can um, answer questions. Um, Jason Pontius was also really critical in this analysis and he's with us as well. So he can answer some questions if you have them about the um, specific analysis that was done throughout um, last year, 2020, um, this cross-institutional team led by Jason uh, really analyzed, as they do every other year, um, the admissions and enrolled student information to, to help us understand and assess uh, the effectiveness of the RAI as an admissions mechanism. Um, the key finding uh, really was that the, the RAI continues to correlate nicely with some of the student success metrics that are important to us. Um, and it does identify where it helps us see at different levels of the RAI um, that additional support may be needed to help us in terms of some of these metrics, in terms of raising retention, raising graduation rates, it helps us identify that. Um, and that's important and that it seems to be doing that fairly well. As a quick reminder, the RAI does have three factors right now. It does use standardized test scores, a high school GPA, and um, uh, the core courses that are from an identified list that students may be taking in high school. Um, so what's important about this report probably is what comes more towards the end. It's important that we acknowledge that it, the REI is, has been working fairly well. However, the future is something we need to talk about because the standardized testing landscape is changing. Um, it has, during the pandemic, raised a particular barrier. Um, thus, as a reminder, the board has approved a temporary um, shift, a two-year shift to a test optional admissions approach. Um, that really does, as I just said, the REI is a three-factor index that takes us to two primary factors left in the, in the index. Um, so while we're in this two-year waiver of, that, of the standardized testing, it feels like, um, and the team has agreed that this is a good time to really dig in and say, uh, what else is it that we need to know, that we do know, that will really help us be effective in our admissions and meeting our objectives, um, both for transparency, but also for equity, as well as um, as it connects to the institutional missions. Uh, so we want to take this time to really dig in and analyze that. You know, ten a decade ago, um, the RAI had four factors. Um, we with some changes in how class ranking is handled at high schools, we went to three. Now we're in, at least in a temporary state, we're at two. And so it's, this is really an opportunity for us to, to, do, to dig in and do that work of, of analyzing this, make sure we're best serving Iowans and meeting the institution's needs. Um, we will spend the time needed. Uh, I'm not here to give you a specific timeline for this. I think the team, um, again, we will work with this cross-institutional team. The team is going to take the time needed to do this um, well, to analyze this carefully. Um, we don't have yet the students even enroll, you know, we're in the process of enrolling these students. So it's gonna take us time to gather a lot of different information. Um, and we will come back to the board 
when when uh, there is more to share in terms of any recommendations about if there are recommended changes to the RAI itself or any other changes that might um, be sort of indicated based on the analysis we do. So I'm happy to take any questions, but again, I have a lot of the other experts um, with us here and they, they can help us with any questions as well. Any questions for Rachel or the institutional experts? Okay, thank, thank you, Rachel, for that, that update. We look forward to hearing more about uh, your analysis on that. Um, next item on the docket is uh, the annual distance education report. And uh, Rachel and uh, the university representatives will present that report. Thank you again, Regent Lynn Meyer. Uh, Brock is going to put some slides up for everybody to see as we talk through this. Um, hopefully you're seeing that now. Um, again, annual distance education report, we were able to come to you with this once a year um, to just sort of let you know and let, let the board, the full board know um, how things are going in this very specific segment of, of the work that we're doing. Um, Brock, if you wanna go ahead. Um, I, I will quickly report just a couple of factors. One, we have continued growth. Um, I like showing this particular update every year because it really emphasizes the breadth of impact that the universities and their distance education they provide have on the state. Um, we're really reaching all 99 counties. We have students enrolled um, in, in our credit bearing courses. Um, the counties surrounding our campuses, you can see our darker colors, they, because they tend to have the greatest numbers. And this really is an indicator, um, as it has been in the past, of the extent to which our on-campus students or, or students who live very in the vicinity there are taking a mix of face-to-face -face courses and distance um, and online courses as part of their degree programs. Um, the report says this, but I wanna emphasize that what you're looking at here is primarily pre-pandemic data. This is the 2019-20 academic year. So even though spring 2020 is when really we kind of got into the middle of the pandemic, um, we were enrolling students for that term in non-pandemic times. So, so just a reminder that these, these numbers do reflect um, sort of that they're sort of the continuation of the trends we'd had in the past, um, which could be look significantly different in future reports. Um, so that's sort of where we are in terms of that mix and the programs, go ahead. Um, one thing that's not in your report that I did wanna raise with you today, um, address is cost of distance education. These have been, these are generally pretty consistent costs from year to year. Um, and we share them today, partly because a lot of questions have been raised um, particularly since March of 2020 about cost of distance education. Um, we've really simplified this to looking at it in two categories, the fixed cost category and the incremental cost category. Um, the fixed costs, of course, are expenses that are irrespective of the mode of delivery for education, whether it was face-to-face -face or online or any, any hybrid version in between. We still have to pay our faculty. We have tutors and advising, counseling, and library services. These are these are things that every single university student requires, whether they're online or not. Um, of course, this is, does not represent all the fixed costs of running the university, but they're they're ones that are very specific to the, the needs of distance education. Incremental cost column focuses on the additional costs that are associated with doing distance ed. So you'll hear our distance ed colleagues talk about some of these categories of activity um, as they talk through the pandemic impact on their work. Um, but I want you to note that even absent a pandemic, our institutions incur these costs of approximately uh, combined to $12 million a year for the very specific training and development needs, the testing, online testing needs, um, all of the things noted there. Um, do our costs that are very specific to having a distance education program at all. Um, so I wanted to just highlight that even though that particular piece doesn't appear in your report. Um, and finally, um, we will go ahead. Yeah, the COVID-19 impact. Um, as I said, this report primarily, um, the data in it primarily precedes this. However, 
the, a few small areas of impact you see are in the non-credit enrollment because those are a lot more episodic and can occur even late spring, you know, things that start then. We did see some impact on the non-credit enrollment numbers. There were de decreased admissions um, and you may have seen that reflected in those numbers on the Bachelor of Liberal Studies and Bachelor of Applied Studies programs that are listed in the report. Um, and then outreach events. Um, our Western Iowa Regents Resource Center, which does a great job of connecting with folks throughout Western Iowa, um, had to cancel a number and, and was not able to do a number of things. Um, I am going to invite my colleagues to share some more right now, and they're gonna really focus on this COVID-19 impact aspect on distance education. Um, and we will kick it off with Anne-Marie Vanderzanden from Iowa State University. Great, well, thank you, Rachel, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak about some of the um, activities and impacts that Iowa State has been uh, addressing uh, during this last uh, academic year. I've got just a few slides to kind of highlight some of the, the main areas that we wanted uh, this group to be aware of. So Brock, if you can go ahead and move forward for me. I think one of the uh, things that I really want to point out is uh, when the decision was made in March for us to move to an online format, um, the initial decision was for a couple of weeks and then, uh, and that was right around spring break time. And then very quickly we realized we would need to stay online uh, for the remainder of the semester. And our faculty and staff were able to transition over 6,000 courses or course sections into an online format in 10 days. Um, there were no delays in our start to our spring instruction. We started up again right after spring break as we were planning. And just for context, um, so we ended up with 6,000 that were in an online format. Before that, we had 528. So we moved a significant number of courses. And it really speaks to the excellence of our faculty and also the excellence of our Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching in supporting the faculty in making these changes. And I'll talk a little bit uh, at, at the end here about some of the specific things that our uh, teaching center has done in supporting our faculty uh, across campus. During this time, we also were able to launch three new online programs. Um, these programs are all connected in with our College uh, of Business, our Ivy College of Business. And they were developed based on uh, market research and demand and identified these as key areas where we would be able to uh, meet a demand, not only in the state, um, but regionally and nationally, and also be able to generate additional um, audience uh, and additional credit hours that would be coming into the institution. The Masters of Real Estate Development is a unique program. It is a joint program between our uh, business and design colleges. The Ivy Executive Master of Business Administration is meeting an executive level MBA need. Um, it is designed to have uh, extensive programs and uh, workshops and a travel component to it that really gets at this executive level of expertise that the cohort brings to the group, but then also to be able to learn from other uh, executives at other institutions. Uh, the intention is that this will have an international component and when international travel will be allowed again, then the group will be able to, uh, to continue doing that. The other uh, new program is a certificate in supply chain management. Uh, this one was identified as a real need, uh, certainly in the Midwest uh, with our significant um, manufacturing presence that we have. This is a way for uh, professionals who are already in the field to be able to get an additional credential that will allow them to uh, further their career or to um, move up within an existing organization. So the intention of all of these is that they will uh, generate uh, new members, uh, new students to come to the university and meet uh, a demand that we've identified. Rachel did mentioned that the BLS and BAS uh, enrollments have been uh, relatively uh, stable or down a little bit over the this last year. 
Um, and that's true. We were uh, down a little bit um, this year to 80 graduates um, as opposed to 85 in the previous year. But one really bright spot I want to bring forward to this group is our involvement with the National Degrees When Due Initiative. Uh, so back in uh, fall of 2019, under Rachel's direction, she got all of the Regent institutions involved in this initiative. We all joined on and the intention is through this national program to identify students who are within a certain number of degree um, credits to be able to complete their degree, that we bring them together, um, help them get to completion and then be able to graduate. So we had an extensive uh, team on our campus in our, our registrar's office, our admissions team. We identified a certain number of students and then continue to kind of winnow it down to those we had contact information on, um, those who didn't have a financial hold that was something that couldn't be overcome. Um, and then we identified about 150 students who were contacted and then worked with them over the next um, eight to 10 months to get them uh, to completion. So I'm just really proud to report that we have 10 students uh, who we were able to identify uh, were near completion. They've been able to graduate uh, in the last eight to 10 months. And we have three more that are in the pipeline right now that just need uh, one more class and some paperwork they need to get finished. And we will have helped them get their degree completed as well. So I think this is just a great opportunity and a great way for us to use this uh, very flexible BLS degree, Bachelor of Liberal Studies, to help students get to uh, degree completion. Can you get the next slide? So if you look at the report, uh, you can see all of the details specific to each institution. I would say that our course offerings have been stable compared to the prior year. Uh, next year, when we really see the full COVID impact, we'll have to figure out how we want to present this data. Um, but I would say that our top course registrations continue to be in the humanities and arts and sciences. Um, this is a real, uh, the, the reason for this is because our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences a number of years ago identified uh, what they call the LAS Summer Bundle. And these are a set of courses that a, a number of our students take um, that meet requirements across a variety of majors. So a lot of gen ed courses, and they continue to offer those multiple times and are really meeting a need for our students. Uh, we also have a fair number of enrollment within the engineering and the human sciences. Again, those colleges have been strategic in identifying what courses they want to offer that allows students to continue degree progression, maybe take a course while they're out on an internship um, or a variety of other reasons, but you know, very, very strategic in the decisions of the courses uh, that we offer. The numbers there you can see uh, our total enrollments were 32,373, up about 6%. The majority of that really is coming from our undergraduate enrollment. And I would say, a lot of that is due to the enrollment during this past summer, at which point all of our summer courses were online. So that's the part of the reason for the increase in that. Our total number of courses that we're offering uh, has remained fairly uh, steady. And can I move to the next slide, please? So one of the areas we've continued to work on even amongst the uh, pandemic is how do we want to structure our university for success moving forward? Our Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, as I mentioned before, has done a uh, phenomenal job supporting our faculty as they've moved and continue to offer a number of courses online or different components of their courses online um, as we continue to navigate uh, through the COVID impacts this semester as well. They've offered uh, nearly 100 different uh, programs, hundreds of hours of specific uh, individualized consulting that they're doing, and really reached uh, almost 800 faculty uh, in helping them get their, their courses and materials updated and improved. The um, focusing really on best practices, a lot of materials available asynchronously as well. One of the other things that we've done uh, through CELT's leadership is develop an ISU branded online course template. 
It's designed to provide a consistent look and most importantly, navigation for our students. And although this may seem like a pretty straightforward type of a thing, um, if you apply it to other courses that we teach, which are face-to-face, -face, those are all very individualized. And so um, it's quite a culture change to get our faculty to have some uniformity in their online classes. It's a work in progress. Um, but hearing positive res responses from the students who are seeing that uniformity in how they navigate their courses in particular. We do have Canvas as our learning management system. That's the template. That's where our courses are housed. Um, we made that change a few years ago and it has proved to serve us very well. It is very user-friendly and most importantly, compatible with a whole range of different technologies that can be plugged in to that system which give fa faculty flexibility in their teaching. And we're continuing to work with IT. Our information technology team is important in keeping not only the technology working for Canvas, but all sorts of other types of things that we are using as part of these courses. Um, one key area is ensuring that we have accessibility that is being met and then other uh, policies that we're able to uh, show that we're accomplishing as well. Uh, as part of the, the uh, online presence that we have. We continue also to have an academic continuity working group, uh, which I chair. And the continuity working group is continuing to evaluate what our academic footprint and presence will be looking like, um, not only this semester, but as we move into the summer and the fall, realizing this is still going to be um, a process as we get back to some level of a, of a new or different or variety or varied uh, normal approach to, to academics here on campus. So we have a, an extensive group that's involved in considering a variety of different components as we continue to look forward. So those are, the, those are the highlights I wanted to share with you. And so thank you, Rachel, for the opportunity to, to share some of these great examples from Iowa State. Thank you. And I think Regent Lindemeyer and Regent Lisa, if it's okay with you, we'll go straight into our next institution. And Ann Zelensky, I think, is gonna share some information with us from the University of Iowa. Great. Anne, have we got you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to um, describe our efforts to support faculty and students as we moved into emergency virtual teaching and learning this past spring, summer, <laughs> fall. Um, uh, next slide, please. So. With regard to the first bullet point, the remote instruction team was charged to create and implement teams to assist faculty in moving courses to the virtual teaching environment. Points of interest include the following. Prior to May 15th, and this is unsurprising, the majority of the requests were for troubleshooting and getting technology set up as faculty urgently put their last six or seven weeks of courses online. After the 15th, assistance was moved to learning new tools, using new tools effectively, and creating additional strategies for teaching effectively in widely divergent course types. The remote instruction team is now offering more focused pandemic to plan workshops that uh, get into the meat of what specific departments and faculty members need, as well as continuing to offer our, our more broad workshops. We're trying to reach as many people as possible again before the fall. Faculty have been wonderful about this and they continue to attend scheduled workshops to help them prepare for the fall teaching. In addition, the Keep Teaching website has been updated as has pandemic to plan, highlighting tips and pedagogical best practices for faculty who want to continue to improve their teaching or as they put different types of courses online. All of the workshops that we offer are archived and available for ongoing education, and they continue to be heavily accessed. In addition to putting all of the university's courses online, and it's the number is right around 6,000, we continue to maintain and extend our um, distance education and online programs. Next slide, please. The resources for faculty are concentrating on the Keep Teaching webpage. And in addition, to, which is organized in four different sections. 
those include uh, the keep preparing the virtual course, supporting students in your virtual course, facilitating it, and administering high stakes assessment. In addition to that, we are trying to have high level discussions about thinking differently about assessment so that faculty don't rush to an online proctoring solution. In addition to that, and I think this is one of the more exciting things we have on this website, are the Success Stories podcasts. These are conducted by faculty. They, are, um, they highlight the strengths, the weaknesses, the obvious challenges of the experiences they all faced as they moved online. They're candid, they're informative, and they're very much appreciated by faculty peers. Um, I want to say, as, as Anne-Marie mentioned about the ISU faculty, our faculty responded quickly and positively to a really strange and stressful challenge. They, they couldn't have worked harder to make this successful for, um, for our students. Their collective efforts were beyond noteworthy, and um, I just want to make sure that that, that is acknowledged. Um, next slide, please. For students, oh, one back, I'm sorry. Um, there is a slide missing, I think. We have resources for students. It doesn't matter. We can, we can get to that later. Um, resources for students include a Keep Learning homepage, which I think is self-explanatory. But what's nice about that is that in addition to the Center for Teaching, student government participated in helping think about what students needed to face the challenges of multi-semester now um, shifts in how they, how they are learning on campus. In addition to that, though, we have Tutor Iowa and Supplemental Instruction, which were moved online. The reason this is important, well, apart from the fact that, <laughs> that we had to move everything online, but the reason it's so important is those two resources reach tens of thousands of students. And I think that the fact that a, a very lean staff of, of primarily um, student peers and, and young tutors were able to do this is, again, really a commendation of um, a quick response to a, a pretty dire need. Finally, we have a success at Iowa required online course for all of our students. And to that, we added two modules. These were created again in cooperation by um, student government and the Academic Support and Retention Office. Um, one of them is preparation for learning online. And the second one is learning success stories, which mirrors the faculty podcasts in a sense in that students really talk to their peers about what shifts they made to be more successful in this um, unexpected environment. And then the student, okay, now to the student feedback page, please, slide, there you go. So we, we routinely, of course, connect, conduct um, faculty evaluations, the ACE supplement survey, but we also created an undergraduate pandemic response survey. And in short, student perceptions were far better than we might have expected, but not quite as positive as we might have hoped. Very few students reported only positive experiences and equally few reported only negative experiences. Um, obviously students understood that conditions were far from ideal and they, they really um, expressed patience and understanding with, um, with the situation as well as with their faculty who were struggling with technologies that they had not previously used to teach. It was very clear from student reactions, however, that there is absolutely no substitute for meaningful engagement with their faculty. They need it, they want it, and they value it. And to that point, while it is challenging and not everyone will love teaching online, we do wanna to emphasize to faculty that there are really good instructional practices um, in virtual instruction that aren't very dissimilar from those employed in face, face classes. Students also expressed an understanding that there aren't any one size fits all solutions. A lecture class is not a lab class, is not a class in the art building or the music building for that matter. And I think that the fact that they understood that was really, again, I was, I was proud of the student response. I felt they were very thoughtful. Obviously the challenges external of the course also really significantly affected student ability to meet their course responsibilities. Um, nearly 30% of students reported that they did not have regular access to internet services for coursework. Now, we, we did a lot of different things to help that. We created parking lots that had Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. But I remember leaving work and going past the, uh, by a bank parking lot and watching a student, a very young looking student, sitting in a car with a phone working on a course. 
And it, it just struck me as, um, you know, good for her. Uh, she, she was really trying, but it seemed really a little bit challenging and sad. I mean, clearly that wasn't an optimal experience for her students. Additionally, those students expressed major stresses external to their course and academic experiences. They were ill, their own family members might have been ill. Some family members lost their incomes, students may have lost their incomes, and a vast majority of students were reported um, having mental health issues that they had not anticipated or previously had not had. And I know we all know that, but it reminds us to be really mindful of student experience and to understand that this really isn't ending, even if the pandemic were to end today, the student experience will, will carry forth into the next few semesters as they move through their um, path to graduation. I am happy to stop there and answer any questions anyone may have um, or invite uh, anyone else from the University of Iowa to add anything that I may have overlooked. And this is Jim, I, I just had one quick question. You mentioned student perceptions. Do you run those on every class or do you, uh, is it a random survey? Uh, the pandemic response survey. So Anne, I can chime in. This is Tanya. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. So we do have um, assessment of course evaluations for every course. Um, I would just note that the supplemental survey was actually open ended questions that were asked of students specifically regarding the response to the pandemic. So yes, we have course evaluations for every course, but these this was a supplement that we did. Okay, does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. Um, sorry, this is uh, David Barker. Do you do you have any um, data on how course evaluations now compared to uh, pre pandemic? like overall we, average course uh, evaluations? You know, we are, I think, and again, Tanya, please correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I think we're in the process right now of looking at that. I mean, clearly correct. that's something important. Is, is that, isn't that something that we are yep. working on currently, Tanya? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. I would note that um, not surprisingly response rates to course evaluations were lower this past semester um, in the fall than normal years. And I think to be quite honest with you, that's probably a reflection of the stressors that students are under at this time. Mm -hmm. Any preliminary idea on how the evaluation numbers compare? In terms of the ratings? No, they're still in the process of reviewing those for fall semester. Okay. When, when do you think we might have that? Um, I can check with the team and get okay. back in touch and let Rachel know. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions for now, I'll invite uh, Kent Johnson from the University of Northern Iowa to share um, an update from your institution. Thank you, Rachel, and good morning to all. And thank you for the opportunity to share perspectives about the impacts of COVID-19 through the lens of online and distance education through UNI. And I'd like to clarify that while the context here is distance education, it's not an exaggeration to say that the pivot to online teaching involved every unit and every person on our campus. So it follows that the impacts have been substantial and complicated. I'll highlight a few key points among many, beginning with the university's readiness leading up to emergency online teaching in March of 2020. If I could have the slide advanced. So like ISU and the University of Iowa, fortunately, you and I had a well-established set of scalable educational technology tools in place. We use Blackboard as our learning management system, Zoom, as you're all very familiar with, for video conferencing, and Panopto as a core tool for lecture capture. As we move to emergency teaching, we also had a long history of providing professional development opportunities and support to faculty interested in teaching online. Beginning in 2011, you and I became a Quality Matters institution, providing professional development for faculty members and best practices in online course design and teaching. Roughly half of you and I's faculty had attended Quality Matters workshops prior to the pandemic and had collaborated closely with an instructional developer from our office in creating an online course. A third component of readiness was grounded in the support systems already in place for distance learners with many years of uh, serving and supporting students off campus uh, in, in online degree programs. So the challenges 
uh, were largely based on a short timeline, compressed timeline, as um, Anne-Marie shared. The scale, um, moving from 10% to 100% online, and also an expanded student population with characteristics that differed from our audiences in the past. Fundamentally, our systems and support structures, including staffing levels, were designed for a volume of 10% online courses as an institution, rather than the 100% required by the pandemic. So preparing faculty for remote instruction and emergency teaching was a genuine challenge. Prior to COVID, online courses were intentionally selected and taught by faculty who cho chose online delivery. Many faculty were familiar with tools and many had developed full on, fully online courses, but teaching an entire course load online was a monumental change requiring tremendous time and effort by our faculty. While individual support was still available, the capacity to engage in the traditional course design process was limited by the timeline involved in our staffing levels. Preparing students was difficult as well. Readiness among our residential students was not <laughs> uneven. Many had taken online courses, but had a clear preference for in-person instruction. We found that segment of our students, that a segment of our students lacked devices appropriate for online courses and reliable internet connectivity. And taking an entire schedule of online courses challenged all students. Anticipating these challenges, the university focused on several interrelated strategies. First, the primary goal was clear that students successfully complete the spring 2020 semester. Student affairs personnel, faculty members, and staff throughout the university reached out to students who were not engaging in their online courses. Students were encouraged to communicate about any issues they were having and assured that support was available. Laptops were checked out and access to virtual academic support services was expanded. A second key strategy was frequent, transparent, and open, consistent communication to the campus community. The forwardtogether.uni.edu site was used as the go-to resource for information and continues to be used uh, to this point. A third key strategy was anchoring our efforts and communication to faculty and staff in UNI's core values of supporting student success and providing engaged learning opportunities regardless of delivery method. And as mentioned, adopting an all hands on deck mentality in which everyone at the university was working towards the same goal of student success was critical. Next slide, please. So advancing beyond the time frame of uh, the report, um, Rachel had asked for um, impacts on summer as well. Um, as the avalanche of work unfolded in the March transition to 100% online delivery, we were also concurrently planning for the summer session at the same time with the same parameter, that like spring, all summer courses would be online, which impacted offerings in that more than 50 faculty members decided to convert an in-person summer section to online. Again, a very tight time frame to develop a fully online course given, given March to a May term start. Some in-person classes were dropped, including study abroad office offerings. Given the intense nature of the spring term, we were not sure what to expect with student interest in summer offerings, but demand was surprisingly strong with more than 5,000 duplicated enrollments, even though in courses were um, delivered entirely online. Summer also presented us an opportunity to provide additional professional development and support for our faculty in preparation for fall 2020 and, and forward. The four units shown on the slide collaborated very closely in planning and delivering a wide range of workshops for faculty. We saw more than 2000 enrollments in the workshops, all offered virtually, an average of more than four professional development activities per faculty member at UNI. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, a few lasting impacts, trajectories and lessons that we've seen. The use of educational technology has clearly accelerated dramatically with the online experience for all our faculty members. We fully expect a much greater comfort level with educational technology tools and capabilities moving forward had it not been for the emergency online teaching. Student feedback confirms, um, like Anne had mentioned, students respond positively to active engaged learning approaches, regardless of delivery. And feedback makes it clear that students choose the residential experience for a reason. They appreciated very much and understood the need to move entirely online, but also provided feedback about a consistent sense of loss of in-person in instruction. 
The development of courses as part of emergency remote online teaching was very different from the intentional planned approach to online development prior to COVID-19. Moving forward, we plan to return to a more comprehensive, intentional model of online course development. We've also seen the value of continuous improvement in the refinement of our systems of, and support for students. And we've seen benefits in challenging our assumptions. For example, that all students are savvy with technology, have bandwidth and appropriate devices for online learning. And last, a little bit different direction here, it seems likely that competition for adult learners will heat up even more in the future as universities from throughout the country leverage their work as part of COVID uh, the transition to emergency teaching and try to increase market share and revenues. I'll stop there and uh, invite Provost Wolpart to add anything. This is such a big topic that impacted our campus from A to Z that uh, it's hard to capture everything in three slides. And thanks, I don't have anything to add except how much I appreciate the, the fast pivot of all the faculty and all the staff support across the board and certainly in continuing in distance education, but everybody in student success and retention started reaching out in new ways. This really was, as all three institutions said, a campus-wide effort. And people are a bit exhausted because it, it hasn't let up at this point, but um, really great presentations. I really don't have anything to add beyond that. Any, any questions or comments for the presenters? Quick one, uh, Kent, do you, do you have any sense uh, of how much uh, course evaluations may have changed uh, from this, just the overall scores from 2019 to 2020? I think, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, those are handled within colleges and departments. I haven't seen any aggregate data. Um, I think Jim and um, I think I saw John Valentine might be on the call, but uh, I'm quite sure our response would be similar to Tanya's that uh, um, that's a work in progress. And our response rates, I do know, were quite modest, which impacts you know the validity of those. Okay. Uh, a quick question, maybe for all of you, it may be different at each institution, but are faculty compensated any differently for online courses than they? are for in-person courses. Regent Linda Meyer, we have a compensation package for faculty who go through the full quality matters training, which is actually very extensive. And so we do provide a stipend for that work that they do. They also get to work with a course designer. There are other shorter modules that faculty can go through that we don't compensate them for. But in terms of the teaching, this is simply a part of their teaching load for the fall. Okay. So there was no extra compensation for them as they took on a really heavy lift. And I want to say, you know, it's not simply that they moved their courses online or this fall hybrid. We still have a lot of face to face classes. As students would step out of a face to face or hybrid class, we asked the faculty to keep the students caught up if they were in quarantine or in isolation. And so they were very often teaching the same class, but in two or three different modalities for one class. And they had three classes where they were doing that. It really, really has been an enormously heavy lift. And again, the staff support, I, I will emphasize, was tremendous in, in being able to navigate this. I, I would just say that uh, I, I know the, the Board of Regents in total uh, really appreciates the flexibility and the effort that the faculty and the staff and the administrative staff put in on this and uh, I think in some ways you did such a good job you made it look so smooth to the public honestly that I don't think you'll ever receive full appreciation for what you took on and uh, and accomplished and uh, uh, it uh, there I think there's a general perception out there that you just flip a switch and and, and you cross over and deliver these things uh, by a different modality. And I was glad to see Rachel's slide addressing costs. And although we didn't see specific costs, I think there's a, also a perception that it's cheaper to deliver education this way. And um, in some cases, I know you can do it in bulk, but uh, I hope the legislature doesn't have that, that perception. But 
I think I think we need at some point to to make a full acknowledgement of the costs and the effort that went into this because um, you, you did a great job really and I, I appreciate it. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Jim, this this is Sherry. I I would just like to add to to your statement. I was sitting here thinking there's a lot of questions I get as to online learning, you know, as things gone on. And I really hope that this isn't a, a public meeting. I hope there's a lot of people out there listening to everything that you've put into this and how extensive it is. And if not, I feel much better prepared to give uh, very good um, concrete answers too. So you, you've done a lot and beyond what I even realized. So thank you, that's all. Regent Lindenmeyer, I'd uh, just like to uh, make a few uh, additional points on this topic. And, and, and one is uh, that, um, uh, you know, there was, there was this um, uh, uh, historic really effort to move all these classes online in response to the pandemic. But we, we do know that, that students um, miss the engagement uh, that comes from, from in-person uh, learning. And this may be a topic that also comes up uh, during discussions with the Student Affairs Committee. But since this is a joint meeting, I think it's important to bring up the point that um, uh, there is a lot of learning and a lot of uh, interaction uh, teamwork, collaboration, and so forth that happens uh, in person uh, in, in the classroom with other students and with the faculty. And we do know that students are not having that same um, uh, type of experience as they would have in normal years. So I think that is, that is one limitation to be aware of. I think another limitation, you know, particularly for a university like Iowa State University is um, the large number of laboratories uh, and studios uh, uh, team design projects and so forth. Uh, that's the, the hallmark of programs in uh, engineering or agriculture or, or design. And so many of those labs and studios have, have uh, uh, been continued in an in-person mode uh, here during the pandemic, uh, but many of them have had to be modified uh, as, uh, uh, as well. So those are, I think, two points as we talk about uh, Online learning, hybrid learning, and in-person learning. I think those are some important points to be uh, to be aware of. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, well, with that, I just want to make a point. Uh, how's it been? Has it been uh, harder to recruit kids out of high school or more competitive community colleges, like for their gen eds, knowing they can do distance ed or online courses at their community colleges? Uh, I was just curious if it's been, and maybe we haven't seen that effect yet. Um, but I was just curious if has it been harder to uh, get students to enroll at the universities knowing that they have distant ed classes mainly for gen eds and compared to these, we actually do have a real sense that the students have not been very interested in coming to the regents institutions unless they can have face to face classes we hear that on a regular basis. Kristen I don't know if you want to share some of the feedback that you hear on a regular basis. Sure. I mean we certainly hear from students and their families that they are. Um, eager to have full in-person opportunities. You know, students are really looking forward to that for fall. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, in fall 20 and, and spring 2021. 20, um, we heard in particular from transfer students that they didn't want to pay full university tuition until they were able to have the full in-person UNI experience in our case. So, you know, we've really worked to build in as many in-person opportunities as possible with COVID mitigation um, in place. And uh, I think looking to fall, people are starting to feel more optimistic and um, eager to make that shift. So as, as Kent said before, we have students who are looking for, some students who are looking for online learning for, for various reasons. Um, um, yeah, our students are excited about coming back to campus and being fully engaged in person in many cases. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. We'll uh, accept the annual distance education report and present it at the next board meeting. Um, Zach, do you wanna lead us into the next discussion? Yep, so the next discussion is about the annual student financial aid report. So uh, Jason Pontius and the university's directors of student financial aid will now present that report. So Jason. 
All right, thank you, Regent Least. We're joined today by the Directors of Student Financial Aid, uh, Roberta Johnson from Iowa State, Tim Bakula from UNI, and Cindy Cipher from University of Iowa. And last semester, the three of them were handed a new task in addition to doing their jobs during COVID, they had to distribute millions of dollars of CARES Act money on very short notice. So today they're gonna to be talking about the highlights from the financial aid report, some national trends in financial aid, and how they distributed some of those CARES Act funds. So I'll turn it over to them. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jason. Uh, our first slide here just discusses a little bit about the national undergraduate financial aid trends that we've seen historically, kind of bringing us forward to today. If you see on the bottom of the chart, this dates back to 2008 and really follows through the recession up until current times here. And one of the things that you'll really notice is the large spike in total federal aid around the 2010-2011 academic year based on where the economy was at that point in time. As Jason framed, as well as those that presented on distance said before, the issues that the um, economy in the, the state of Iowa nationally are seeing based on COVID-19 have had a tremendous impact on a student's ability to pay for college or families as well. Knowing that, one of the things that each of the three universities are bracing for is a slight uptick in um, dollars of federal need coming through over the next several years. Um, as an example, the 2020-22-2020-23 FAFSA is truly the first time that students will have to indicate what their incomes were in the 2020 tax year, for instance. So it may still be a few years until we see the full ramifications of what COVID-19 has done for families financially. I can speak to, and I think I'm speaking for all three of us when I say we've seen the micro level appeals of students throughout the year go up tremendously in terms of needing the support for their families based on job loss, medical expenses, or those types of COVID-19 related efforts. One other national trend that that I'll kind of share here first is um, also related to FAFSA filing. That's something that we've read quite a bit about over the last several months since the FAFSA has opened in October. Um, as we might have seen back in October, FAFSAs nationally were down about 16%. And generally speaking, the FAFSA is a great indicator for students' intentions to enroll. Um, seeing those troubling trends, each of the three universities worked with their staffs in both admissions, financial aid, and across campus to develop alternative plans to continue outreach to students that may be receiving remote education in their um, senior year classrooms. With many of the larger school districts being remote, the access that the Iowa College Access Network had to providing outreach and in, in forms of leadership and FAFSA completion were somewhat stunted in the fall. Um, I am happy to, to announce at least that each of the three universities has seen that um, gap in terms of FAFSA completion sw slowly um, dwindle. So that has been a, a reassuring sign here as we head into the 2021-22 academic year. Next slide, please. Yes, I was muted. It's a <laughs> okay. common, common occurrence of this time for us, but um, I think it's important for us to have this framework when we're talking about financial aid, for you to have the, the visual perspectives of how much financial aid is coming from where and uh, understanding the uh, large amount of money that is coming from the federal government and how our students benefit from that. And then therefore the uh, need for those students to be filing the FAFSA so that we're certain that all students who might be eligible for a Pell Grant, for instance, are getting themselves into the mix to be considered for that. So um, we, we uh, continue to ramp up our efforts and continue to work with families to make sure that they are filing and that students aren't making decisions about whether they will qualify or not without the facts. You know, it's, we, we want them to submit the FAFSA. And uh, you can also note the, the heavy lift that the Regent schools themselves are doing to support student um, educational cost. Uh, one of the pieces, of course, that I want to point out is that our state aid represents less than 1% of the financial aid that was dispersed to our students during the 2019-20 year. And then if we take a look at the 
pie chart on the right, you'll see that even with that state aid being less than 1%, the vast majority of the money that mm -hmm. is being considered to be state aid is really coming from the Iowa National Guard. And in, in many ways, the foundation of that Iowa National Guard money is federal money. So I, I just, I, I think it's important as we look to funding um, resources and, at, and look to ways to assist our students with those uh, financial aid gaps for the future, it's important for us to note and to be aware of the where that funding is coming from and the, the lack of the state funding. Next slide, please. So if financial aid offices are putting together uh, financial aid offers for our students, um, we know that student loans have long been a part of the, the mosaic of programs that we're utilizing to assist our students. And indeed, Iowa um, has been on um, many national uh, headlines in years past for having amongst the highest debt of uh, all of the states in the nation. I'm happy to say that we're not uh, in that designated group uh, anymore. But there's some national statistics that, while we're still very concerned about this, are reassuring. Uh, first, both the total and average borrowed undergraduate uh, per borrower um, have declined in inflation adjusted dollars since 2010-11. Now, this can also be uh, attributed to the improvement in the economy, uh, so that students are potentially not having to borrow as much. And so as we look forward to the next couple of years, as Tim mentioned, uh, and the effects of the pandemic, uh, it will be interesting to see what will happen to our, in, the indebtedness levels of our students. Um, it's also important to note that 13% uh, of students at the for-profit institutions and 31% of students that are at public institutions have been able to complete a bachelor's degree without debt. And indeed, um, some of our schools, uh, I know Iowa State, our students are higher than the, that 31% that are borrowing with no debt. So that's a point of pride. Um, and, and finally, uh, approximately 82% of our bachelor degree recipients at public four-year in, four institutions nationally that are coming from low-income families with adjusted gross incomes below 28,000 are graduating with less than $20,000 of student debt. Um, I think that this is just really critical to um, keep in mind that oftentimes, as we know, uh, headlines are what grabs readership. And so uh, oftentimes in the media, you're going to see the most outlandish stories. And um, we don't necessarily want to attribute that to being a full national trend because the statistics are not bearing that out. Next slide, please. So um, again, this is just a graphic that shows what had ha has happened to uh, the borrowing in inflation adjusted dollars. Um, and as mentioned, it was increasing. Uh, you can see the peak there in 9, 10 and 10, 11, and it has been decreasing. We are now lower than where we were back in the 2004, five year in terms of inflation uh, adjusted dollars. But again, it will be interesting to see what happens as we move forward. Next slide, please. However, given those uh, reassuring national trends, there are still challenges that we are facing. Uh, though the net price that the students at our region institutions are paying, um, and the net price being described as the total cost of attendance less any gift aid that the student is receiving, whether it's from Pell Grants, institutional grants, or scholarships, um, there is still a gap. So looking at uh, the, the lowest band there of students with adjusted gross incomes coming from families with adjusted gross incomes between zero or, and 30,000, um, what they would pay is, is certainly less than those students that are coming from families that have more resources available to them. But the challenge is that we've already given them institutional grant and we've given them federal grants uh, as Cindy showed, uh, the amount of state grant dollars are available are very specified uh, primarily for our National Guard students. And so the opportunities for students to make up this difference uh, and in their net price 
primarily will be looking at either uh, work options or loan options for those students. Um, we know that it is unrealistic to expect that a student would be able to work and earn over $11,000 uh, while also being a full-time student uh, in school. And so for many of our students, uh, borrowing is a reality uh, for them. The other challenge that we face is that based on federal guidelines, the amount that a student is eligible to receive is contingent upon their grade level in college. So for a freshman student, the maximum that that student can borrow is $5,500. That still leaves this lowest income student with a gap of almost $6,000 to make up uh, in order to meet their full cost of attendance. Uh, it improves when a student gets to be a junior or senior because the maximum they can borrow is $7,500. And if they're borrowing, say, a standard work study job allocation of about 3000 per year, they're getting much closer to being able to meet that total cost of attendance. Next slide, please. We know that financial literacy initiatives are important to all of you, and they're important to us. We want to make sure that our students um, have the right background to make decisions that are going to put them in positive positions for the future. Um, their education is one of the most important investments they can make. So um, having to, to finance some of that um, educational investment through a loan is not something that is concerning to, to me personally. I mean, it, it may be something that they have to do, but we wanna make sure that they have manageable amounts. We don't want our students to be those students that are highlighted in, in the newspaper loan amounts over $100,000. So we take financial very seriously on all emphasis. Um, the thing we want to talk about is the federal requirements and those mandate that schools send a college planning letter. Uh, we might call it the financial aid offer. In the past, it was known as the financial aid award letter. And that communication piece helps families to understand what the gap is between their full cost of attendance. We make that net price highlighted so that they know what the cost is minus their grants and scholarships. What's left and what am I going to have to come up with, whether that's through my family or through loans or through work. Um, but other things that we wanna make sure families are very aware of with that uh, college planning letter or financial aid offer is, is what goes into this whole mystery of my educational cost. Um, how can I compare financial aid offers from school to school? So we wanna make sure that they understand what those components are to the cost. Um, tuition and fees, uh, books and supplies, housing and meals, personal and transportation. So that they can see that if those things are all listed on one school's letter, how are they displayed on another school's letter? And I can compare apples and apples. And I can then understand what is the, the real uh, portion that's left for me to cover or to find a way to cover. And then when the student gets to that point of understanding what's on that uh, college planning letter and, and what's left, that's when the financial aid offices come into play in terms of those individual conversations. And as you'll remember, we um, all went home about the middle part of, of March, yet we had families that were very much in the throes of making those important decisions and trying to decide by, by May of 2020 where they were going to go to school. So just like uh, all of the um, academic personnel have been talking about the great pivot that our instructors and faculty did, and, and they definitely did, I know all of us in financial aid would commend our staff for making that quick pivot as well. Uh, because we all learned very quickly to be meeting with students and families by Zoom rather than meeting with them in person or having much longer conversations on the phone than maybe we would have normally when we could have met with somebody. 
um, because we wanted to make sure that even if we weren't able to do this in person, that the students clearly understood what they were getting into and had a way to understand those finances and then make the decision. Uh, because the, the worst thing for any of us is to have a student start classes in the fall and realize by the end of fall that they can't continue in the spring, that they don't have the financial wherewithal to do that. So we wanna make sure that we have those conversations uh, March through, through May, really, um, February, whatever, but that the students, by the time they make the decision to attend, that they've worked out a plan by which they are going to be able to afford to attend the school. And um, we really feel that that is our, our mission to, to make sure from a student first perspective that we're giving the students all the tools that they need to make that decision. Um, one piece that comes in to help students with that is the entrance counseling that students must do if they are going to borrow for the first time through the federal programs. So we want to make sure with that entrance counseling that they understand details about their loans. It, is the loan going to, is it a subsidized loan and it's going to not have interest while they're in school or is it the unsubsidized loan where their interest is going to accrue? Um, these are all new terms for the students and, and many for our parents. Um, at the University of Iowa, over 25% of our enrolled students are first generation students. And those numbers are likely similar at our other region schools. So those families and students don't have the background to know some of this information. And so it's our job then to provide that. Um, on the flip side with the entrance, when the student gets to the point of graduating, there is a federal mandate for exit counseling because we wanna make sure then that the student understands what their um, next, you know, initially we wanna understand, we wanna make sure they understand their rights and responsibilities as a borrower through the entrance. When we hit the exit, we wanna make sure that they understand how they're going to uh, pay those loans back. You know, what are their different uh, payment plan options? What's going to work best for them so that we can ensure that our students don't run into loan default. One of the other things that is very important for us for financial literacy, the first thing is making sure that students um, understand the cost and make the decision to attend wisely. The next is making sure that we're really helping students understand how to manage money, not only when they're in school, but for the future. And um, one of the things that, that you have all uh, helped us with really is the, the regents um, have required that we have this financial literacy component that we, that we do um, offer this. And so all three regents institutions offer the same financial literacy curriculum, but we do have different delivery modes. Now, we have uh, partnered with the National Endowment for Financial Education and have used what's called Cash Course as one of our online um, delivery tools. Um, the National Endowment for Financial Education is going to be leaving uh, this market. They're not going to be doing that anymore. So we have one more year in which we're going to be able to utilize that product. But what we have decided uh, in partnership is that rather than purchase or, or uh, take advantage of some other uh, program that's being offered out there, we know a lot about our students and we feel like we know what, how they are going to respond best to curriculum. And so we are right now in the midst of a collaborative process by which we are going to revise, update, create a new curriculum that we will be able to offer our students. Um, We've all received a lot of feedback from the students who have taken the class over the years. Um, we're gonna be able to utilize that feedback to develop a product that we feel is really going to be an even better product for our student. Um, many of the students talk about how they've never had to be concerned about money management in the past and that the course has taught them 
ways in which they can track their expenses, track their uh, expenditures, um, better understand the difference between a want and a need, um, and even go into things that they will need for the future in terms of uh, better understanding credit and how credit is calculated so that they don't find themselves in a position of having a bad credit score, um, thinking about investments, mortgages, all kinds of things for the future. And so we're, we're proud of, of what we will be able to offer, offer our students and how that will really make them we think educated citizens so that we're putting them in the best position possible when they leave our institutions. Roberta or Tim, anything you wanna to add to that regarding financial literacy initiatives before we move on? Oh, I was gonna kind of add some on the next slide actually. I can speak okay. to it there, but I, I suppose Roberta, maybe you can tag up after that. So. On, on this slide, it, it kind of shows some of the outcomes of, of the work that our offices have done over the last uh, decade or so. Looking at the debt for graduates um, from the region, well, from all Iowa four-year universities, I guess in this case, where you'll see the regions though is towards the upper end of that list with the lowest average debt for graduates that carry debt. Um, this is from the College Aid Commission uh, and, and really some very um, excellent outcomes that speak to what, what um, Cindy had just shared with us previously. The one piece that I was going to kind of point out as, a, as another means to get to this point was um, some of the intentional outreach and communication that's done with students that are looking at borrowing private loans. So as we, as an office, kind of discovered why is a student borrowing what they are and looking at their possible options, um, close to 12 years ago, at UNI at least, we started looking at providing additional counseling for those that are borrowing above and beyond the federal loan limits that Roberta had mentioned earlier. Um, that's really where we start seeing students get into problematic borrowing down the road, um, borrowing tens of thousands of dollars more than they may need to um, through private lenders. Those lenders still exist, they've always exist, existed and they always you know, will continue to. But I think what we all three changed was the tact in which we took with students to approach them about educating on how much we're actually borrowing there. So you can see with our levels at you and I, the 23,671 in Iowa and Iowa State, um, just a little bit over that, the efforts that go into encouraging a student not to borrow any more than what they absolutely have to in those private loans goes a long ways. Um, I, I still do some of that counseling myself in this position and I find it um, kind of one of the more uh, enjoyable aspects of my job in terms of actually seeing the impact on individual student faces when they realize I may only need to borrow $1,000 instead of 4,000. Or you know what, I might not even need this private loan after we had a discussion about budgeting for paying my off-campus expenses, things that they hadn't maybe thought about previously. And so I give a lot of credit to our students and families in, in terms of kind of heeding the advice that we may have and really doing a tremendous amount of planning, as, as Cindy was pointing out, from the award letter and even prior to that, you know, sometimes even now beginning with birth almost and planning for how are we going to pay for college here. So there's been a tremendous um, expansion of, of counseling efforts, both at the Regent universities, as well as the high schools and, and on down through um, younger ages as well. So this is something that we're, we're extremely proud of as a Regent system. I think it speaks well of what we do in our offices and of the students that we assist there too. So thank you, Tim, for bringing up the private loan counseling because yes, that is a, a significant um, thing that we require our students to participate in if they are going to take out a private loan. Yes, same same at Iowa State. Yes, we can go to the next slide then, and it kind of dovetails off of this one in terms of what we've been helping educate students on. This is looking at the three-year default rate for the graduating class of 2017. And so what the Department of Education uses is a three-year cohort model for determining default rates at, at uh, college campuses. And you can see once again, each of the three regions is side by, region side by side as compared to other four-year publics, um, community colleges and, and others throughout the, the state and nation there um, doing extremely well. And once again, I think this goes back to the efforts that are put in towards the entrance and exit counseling, as well as the students asking excellent questions 
finding jobs once they're done with college, obviously, and then making sure to make a commitment to repayment. Um, one of the things that we cover in our private loan counseling sessions is who your federal servicer is. And that's a big predictor in terms of will a student default or not? Do they even understand the concept of what a federal loan servicer is? Um, th they have a notion that they've borrowed something from the Department of Education, but who is this third party that's now contacting me or might have emailed me from the first time that I received a loan? Pointing those touch points out to them during their undergraduate experience only helps kind of build that bridge between them and their servicer to help ensure that the default rates remain um, at an extremely low level. And that's that's kind of where you'll see those at, at for the three regions there. So with that, I think we can go to the next slide as well. Our next part here is gonna concentrate on the CARES Act, our, the first um, round of funding that we received um, last spring. And uh, we wanted to start just by giving you the visual for how much money we received. Um, as, as Jason said, we, uh, we got a whole lot of money and uh, it was greatly appreciated, greatly needed by our students. Uh, not something that often happens in the financial aid world. So um, the, the opportunity to assist our students in this way was, um, was wonderful. And uh, we, you can see uh, the portions that went then to our resident undergraduates, um, non-residents, and, and you can also see the, the totals. Uh, now, the one thing that I wanted to point out just uh, from my own perspective, uh, because you've all, I'm sure, seen the dollars in the, in the news or whatnot, and I just wanted to clarify with my footnote um, that there was a small portion of the University of Iowa uh, funding that was uh, will be attributed to fiscal year 21. Uh, it was awarded in the summertime to some pre professional students whose um, academic year uh, for the 2021 year started in the summer. So when they received those funds in the summer, really being attributed to next year. But all three of the schools uh, spent their their total amount um, right away. Next slide. And now we want to talk really about how each of the schools um, administered these funds. Um, I'm going to start and we're each going to have an opportunity to, to share in. Um, many of the things that will have been done will have been common across the three schools, uh, but some things have been uh, unique. And so the first thing I just want to talk about is how we received a large sum of money, but we received it really when the academic year was almost over for us. So we felt a great deal of urgency to get this money out quickly because our students had been, and their families, had been dealing with these uh, financial hardships for, for a few months, you know? And, and so now we've got this money and, and we want to make good use of it. So we, um, we wanted to act quickly, uh, but we were also dealing with the fact that uh, the government regulations were somewhat sparse and they were changing. So we were wanting to make sure that we knew what we were doing um, and we're going to do it right when we started to give that money out. Um, we, really leaned into our campus partners and our relationship networks to make sure that we were communicating to the students, that we were reaching the students who needed this money. Um, the, the CARES Act talked about how the money needed to be given to students who um, were experiencing financial hardships caused by the disruption of the pandemic. So. Um, we wanted to, to make sure that we were reaching those people. Uh, at the University of Iowa, we have a, a, a campus COVID update that goes out three times a week. The other schools also will have those kind of institutional messaging that went out. So that was a way for us to reach everybody. And that was important. But we also know that sometimes even though we would hope that the students who are experiencing financial distress will contact the financial aid office and therefore we would know about them and help them, 
sometimes those students are more uh, inclined to contact someone that they already have a relationship with on campus, whether that's uh, somebody in their diversity office, somebody in their counseling office, somebody in their academic advising office. So we made sure to work with our campus partners so that if they knew of students who were in distress, they would be reaching out then to, to or encouraging them to reach out to us and encouraging them to utilize the mechanism in which we were uh, going to be letting people basically raise their hands. We, we had an application process at each of our schools. And so we wanted to make sure that the students who needed that money got into the application. Um, one other thing that uh, we did was to communicate directly with those students who were Pell Grant recipients, because our students who are our neediest students, um, sometimes they're not as strong about advocating for themselves. And sometimes they may be um, dealing uh, with a lot of things, whether that's their own finances or even sometimes helping their family with their finances and may not be uh, keeping up with all those communications that are being sent out. So we wanted to not just rely on the campus communications, but do some direct outreach. Um, in the application process, we wanted feedback from the student about what it is that they were going to be using the funds for. Um, what it was that was causing them to have the financial hardship. Um, and we wanted to always have as our goal that we were serving our neediest students first. Um, one of the, the requirements of the first round of money was that the funds had to go directly to the students. They could not be used to pay university bills. Now, there's nothing that said that we couldn't release the money to the student and the student couldn't choose to pay a university bill. But we all worked with our uh, billing services offices to ensure that when we awarded the student the money, that the money went directly to the student, um, either through direct deposit or through a check if the student had not set up a direct deposit. We now are at the point um, where we're gonna have another, well, we do have another round of funding. And so we wanna look at what we learned the first time. Um, one of the things we learned was that the application process is very labor intensive. Uh, although there are some advantages to the application process because it ensures that everybody gets a chance to raise their hand, to identify themselves. Uh, but we also found that just as I was saying, Earlier, sometimes our media students were not the students that were advocating for themselves. So there's also a interest in looking not just at applications, but maybe in fact, in some cases, moving away from an application to more of what's called a block grant so that we have the opportunity to assess our own students' needs and ensure that the money is going to students who have as the round of funding is identifying it, exceptional financial need. So we can make that happen, whether the student advocates for themselves or not, we know our population. Um, we also know that sometimes students, uh, because they're not maybe paying attention to all of the emails because they get a lot of them, um, they may miss things. And so we want to, if we are going to have a deadline for the application, we want to be very clear with that deadline, be very transparent with our communication in terms of who can apply and how they can um, demonstrate exceptional financial need. Um, there are also some other differences with that second wave of funding. And one of those is that the student can opt to have the money go to the university bill. Um, so our applications, if we're, if we're going to use them, um, will have a question by which the student in regarding the university bill. Um, the funds can cover any cost component in that student's cost of attendance. Uh, but then again, the priority is to our neediest students. And uh, so we are, all of us in the process right now of 
determining what our plan is going to be in order to get that money out. Um, and then we'll be shortly uh, working towards uh, doing that so that we can ensure that the money will have an impact on our students here for the spring semester. Tim, I'm gonna turn it over to you next sure. to talk about things. Sure, and I'll just add on briefly to, to Cindy, a lot of your remarks, um, summarizing how each of the three of us tackled this. Um, at UNI for the CARES Act funding the first round, we did have an application process that students were able to do prior to the end of the semester. It opened in April and ended in May, um, allowing them to kind of self-identify. However, one of the inherent risks with that is, as Cindy did a good job of summarizing, is were all of the right students aware of the application or had the means to do that? Um, one of the things that we were able to do at UNI was um, work with our foundation, our dean of students, and other campus partners to create funds for those students that may not have technically done the CARES application, but may still have that need based on COVID um, related expenses. So our foundation helped create a UNI first, or I'm sorry, a uh, UNI together fund, excuse me, that students could be awarded that would help them in case they missed the application. We, we've awarded extensively out of that, as well as our Dean of Students Emergency Fund. We've identified students through those channels as well to hopefully incorporate any student that truly was struggling at that point in time, the ability to receive some relief. Um, the second wave of funding, as Cindy said, is, is kind of underway right now. Um, each university is, is kind of looking at their options at this point. I'll turn it over to Roberta. Can I add one thing quick, Roberta? Sure. I should yeah. always let Tim go first because Tim reminds me of things that I should, um, the I wanted to add uh, for all three of the schools is just that we have FAFSA as our oh. guide system. Um, that we too had partnered with our Dean of Student Services, Dean of Students Office on emergency grant funding uh, because just as would be true at the other schools, we had students who weren't eligible based on federal regulations to apply for this money. So our international students, our DACA students, our undocumented students. And we also wanted to be serve those students. And so the Dean of Students did a great job of uh, helping to support those students. We partnered with students and it had funded students originally, but they really were eligible for CARES money we covered that, thereby giving money back to the Dean of Students Office by which they could then work to support students that we weren't able to support with the CARES money. And I'm sure I'll think of something after Roberta says some more comments, <laughs> but now it's Roberta's turn. Well, I don't want to belabor um, the things that both Iowa and you and I have done because Iowa State did very similar things with an application process where students could raise their hand. We also did do some block grants to make sure that we were awarding our students uh, that had exceptional financial need. We had great support from the ISU Foundation to create a Cyclone Strong Award. Uh, we also, because of our participation in the University Innovation Alliance, had additional resources come to us via the UIA. Uh, and uh, we also had extra support through some of our other completion grant programs uh, that we had available. So through the application process, um, it did enable us to look at a student holistically and determine which bucket of funds we could utilize to assist that student. But the one thing um, that Iowa State did that's a little bit different is that uh, we did partnership, did a partnership with our Parks Library. And um, as mentioned earlier, uh, with those students who have uh, had a digital challenge because they did not own uh, some sort of a laptop or uh, an electronic device to assist them uh, during this time. Uh, our Parks Library was receiving applications from students to be able to check out laptops for fall semester. And uh, they reached out to us and I think it was kind of a, a mutual reaching out to each other, but we partnered with them uh, to identify students who had requested to uh, borrow a laptop for fall semester who would meet the criteria for the CARES Act dollars and then through our office, we're able to award those dollars, uh, award those students with dollars to support their purchase of their own personal device. Um, we were able to serve over 300 students in this fashion. Uh, and so uh, ho hopefully that made a big difference for those students this last fall semester in participation in their classes and their ability to move forward. Um, 
we are also on the brink right now of making those final decisions about uh, how we will uh, spend the next round of CARES Act money um, with those dollars going out very, very soon. Um, with that, um, we are concluded with the slides and are um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Sure, thanks. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Roberta, I think you had a slide that showed a national trend of declining student debt. And I'm just wondering if that's true in Iowa. If I look at the table on page eight uh, of the docket, I'm not sure I see that trend in Iowa. So um, yeah, that is a national trend. Um, I, I can say that at Iowa State University, we have held pretty much stable um, uh, so, you know, sometimes we'll fluctuate up a few hundred or down a few hundred, um, but we've stayed fairly flat in terms of the overall borrowing of our, uh, the overall indebtedness of our students. I would also say that um, the one big piece for us is that we actually saw the percentage of our students that are graduating with debt has dropped uh, significantly during that period of time. So while the actual amount might be staying flat, the percentage has dropped over a period of time. We previously had over 72% of our graduates that had borrowed at the all time high and we are now less than 60% of our students uh, having debt. So that's a significant reduction in the percentage of students that are graduating with debt. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Is there any further questions or comments, statements at this time? Well, if not, uh, thank you. Uh, and we will accept the annual student financial aid report. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Zach. Uh, our final report is the annual diversity report. Rachel, can you introduce our guests for that report, please? I sure will, Regent Linnemeyer, but I think what we're going to do actually, um, because in the interest of time, it was a fantastic um, set of reports we've had already today. And uh, with our next um, committee meetings coming up shortly, I wanna make sure we have time to do justice to the diversity report. Um, I'm gonna recommend that we maybe have our presentation on that at a future board meeting. Um, I will note the report itself is in the docket um, and it has been submitted to the legislature per our um, state requirements. So the report itself stands, but I would like to maybe, um, and apologies to the presenters, but um, delay the presentation on that if you don't mind so that we can give it its um, due diligence later. Is that, are, are you okay with that Regent Lindemeyer, Regent Least? I, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'd, I'd look forward to that report and- uh, at the board meeting then next week. So yeah, I, and I also apologize to the to the presenters. Just went a little long there. Those were great reports. Yeah. Yep. I agree with regional and okay. if okay, if there, we will work on getting any, that rescheduled. Uh, okay. If there aren't any objections to that, we'll uh just uh conclude the meeting and uh and adjourn this the uh academic affairs and student affairs uh meetings. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we will go ahead and call the Property and Facilities Committee meeting of the Board of Regents February 17, 2021 to order. Uh, we'll start out with the minutes of the November, two, November 10, 2020 committee meeting. Are there any additions or changes or corrections to those minutes? If not, well, by consent, we will approve those minutes. Thank you.
Register of University of Iowa Capital Improvement Business Transactions, Rod Leonards, please. Regent Dokovich, thank you. And thank you to the other committee members. Um, the University of Iowa has four projects to present at today's meeting. Uh, the first of the four is, um, the, uh, is a permission to proceed with planning. Hardin Library for Health Sciences renovate levels one through three. Um, we will be in this project uh, uh, studying and then ultimately upon Board of Regents approval, um, renovating roughly 27,000 square feet of space uh, on two of the four levels of the Hardin Library for the Health Sciences. This building was built in 1974 and virtually no upgrades to that building have occurred since. Um, and in looking at the changing environment and the consolidation of library functions and support functions for the health sciences, we have found through our studies uh, to make the space as efficiently used as possible, the ability to upgrade and fix, if you will, two of the floors and make those um, uh, available for um, use by our Office of uh, health and safety associated with research, but also our research uh, endeavor support functions on campus. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of the research endeavors are on the health sciences campus. So consolidation of those functions at a location that is next to and available uh, on the health science campus um, from a planning perspective seems wise. This would be a project that at this stage is estimated to be 5.5 to $7 million. We would be funding it through treasurer's temporary uh, investment income and or building renewal funding. Um, one thing to note, and as part of the request, when we started our notion of, of looking at this project and doing a feasibility study, we did a full uh, uh, search for consultant firms for that feasibility study. Within our search, we um, uh, did indicate to those who were pursuing the project that we may um, also move with the board's approval to extending um, the successfully selected firm to do the design work on that project as well. CMBA Architects of Des Moines was selected for that project. The feasibility study has been successful. And as such, we are asking the board to um, uh, approve our extending uh, CB CMBA as the architect for the design of the project as well. Um, one of the things to note, as I mentioned with a building that um, was built in 1974 with little or no uh, renovations or modernization since that time, we would be addressing roughly $2 million in deferred maintenance alone with this, apart from making the building more efficient, uh, more populated, more used, and for functions that are important for the health science campus. Um, as part of the project also to look forward, I want to make sure people understand that when the Office of Environmental Health and Safety would relocate to this site, uh, they currently exist in four structures, uh, antiquated and obsolete houses, former houses that are located um, on and along Grand Avenue and um, Grand Avenue Court. Um, those buildings uh, are, not, um, um, are not buildings to be preserved or uh, protected for future use. They are obsolete and both functionally and operationally. And as we finish this project and would move that function into the Hardin uh, Sciences Library, we would be coming back to the board to the Board of Regents for uh, the removal of those obsolete buildings at a future time. And that would also um, buy uh, uh, away more of our deferred maintenance needs on campus. <coughs> the second of our four projects is uh, the Pharmaceutical Sciences Research Building Renovate North Wing. This again is also a permission to proceed uh, project where we would go through a search for the right consultant for this project upon your approval. Um, this project would uh, convert roughly 21,000 square feet of existing lab space on the upper two floors of the North Wing of the pharmacy building for use as office space, less um, complicated and energy needing space and, and the expenses that were making the building obsolete and uh, antiquated for research would be simplified by making it office space. You, you may, uh, well, I'll, I'll start by saying it's a, at this point estimated to be a four and a half to five and a half million dollar project. Again, funded by treasurer's temporary investments, income and building renewal funding. Um, you may recall the 1961 North 
wing of the pharmacy building was one we had slated to raise following the completion of the pharmacy building project, which is complete. Um, however, in, in our investigations and our studies and our master planning on campus, uh, we recognize that by <clears throat> simplifying the building, making lab space, office space, we would begin to um, enable a shifting of other health sciences related office space and consolidate at that site, thus actually allowing us to empty the 1919 built West Lawn, which has been an operationally problematic building for decades and, increase, and, and an increasing challenge for us. Um, and thus enabling the raising of a larger building with more deferred maintenance. So um, through additional study, we believe that this is uh, the highest value and highest efficiency use of campus space. And this investment will allow for um, additional work will, which will have both deferred maintenance and ongoing operational benefits to the university. Um, so uh, in, in this case, as I mentioned, we will conduct a standard consultant um, uh, search process uh, for uh, for the project. One note on the West Lawn, uh, we, West Lawn itself, this enables the, the raising of West Lawn has roughly $20 million in deferred maintenance and an annual operating cost of uh, roughly $900,000. The third of our four projects is a project description and budget for the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics Pomerantz Pavilion installation of a new linear accelerator in Vault C. Um, this would be a project that has a, uh, a budget that we're asking for approval from the Board of Regents for of $3,739,122, a fairly exact number. Uh, this would be funded by University of Iowa Hospitals uh, building usage funds and or revenue bonds. Um, the project uh, to um, replace an existing and outdated Siemens linear accelerator with a new Versa HD linear accelerator in vault C of that building in the uh, radiation oncology suite um, addresses primarily this and a, a over the last just over the last two years a 17 percent increase in in patient counts uh, related to cancer treatment so the volumes continue to go up year over year um, this allows for this project will allow for increased patient volumes, minimizing patient weights, and also um, a, a, a backup continuity with a, with a second uh, linear accelerator where the two will be able to work together to make sure that we have business continuity, even in downtimes, but with the two of them working together, a much more efficient operation. Um, the work does also include updates to space that support and are surrounding um, this linear accelerator, including casework, storage space, monitor uh, stations for it, um, and control room space updates. So that's the, that's the, um, the context of the work that surrounds uh, that project. Uh, and the fourth of our four projects, uh, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, Roy Carver Pavilion, this is Expand Heart and vascular cath labs project. It's actually a revised budget to an approved budget by the Board of Regents. Um, uh, we advanced the project upon Board of Regents approval at a budget of $28 million. Um, and that was approved in November of 2020. Uh, we received bids on February 9th, 2021, had five competitive bids, uh, but the bids were above the level that had been estimated by the uh, consultants and thus driving the, the budget for the project. Um, the combination of the bidding market in, in interviewing the contractors and with the tight range of, of bids, the bidding market and the complicated nature of the project, the type of project, its complications, but also within a space confined within the existing hospital and surrounded by spaces that would be and would continue to be used during that project drove up costs by the contractors that were bidding on the project. So as a result, and to advance the project, the university is asking for the board's concurrence and approval of an increase to the budget of $2.6 million for a total project budget of $30 million. $600,000 uh, funded again as it was when it was uh, originally approved by the board by University of Iowa Hospitals building usage funds and, and revenue bonds. Um, and so that's a that's a revised budget and um, the final of the four projects we're bringing to this committee today.
Are there any questions for Rod on any of those four projects from the committee? Okay, Rod hearing none, we will submit those by consent. Those are approved and we'll submit those to the board. Thank you. Thank you. So register of Iowa State University Capital Improvement Business Transactions. Pam Kane, please. Thank you, Regent Dokovich, members of the committee. Um, Iowa State has two projects to bring before this committee today. Um, the first one is the Jack Trice Stadium East Gateway Bridge. Uh, we are requesting approval of the schematic design project description and budget for a $10 million project. And this, your approval, board's approval will um, authorize our ability to proceed with construction. This project um, is funded with donor, private donors. It will construct a bridge over South University Boulevard. Um, and what's in, as in the board docket, um, the schematic design, it will include two towers, which will also serve as an entry feature for the campus. Um, it will connect the East Concourse of Jack Trice Stadium, specifically Gate 2, and the football game day parking east of South University Boulevard with an elevated walkway. A sidewalk will also be constructed along the east side of the existing stadium um, and will have a fence that matches the existing fence along South University Boulevard. The construction bids are expected in early summer of 2021 with construction to begin during the summer of 2021. Um, with an anticipated completion of early fall of 2022. And since the city of Ames owns the right of way of South University Boulevard under the proposed bid, bridge, um, we need an agreement and which is being developed with the city, the regents and university council. So we are requesting board approval to delegate the authority to the executive director to execute the final agreement on that right of way. Are there any questions on Jack Trice Stadium Bridge? Any questions on that project? Okay. So our second project is the poultry farm <laughs> teaching research facilities. We are requesting uh, approval of a project description change as well as a budget increase of about 2.4 million for a total project of 9.2 million. Um, this will allow um, for additional industry recommended research opportunities, which increases the square footage. It will add uh, computerized feeding equipment as well as automated controls to support research activities, as well as biosecurity features, including controlled entrances and lockers. The facility will be constructed under a competitive bid contract separate from the chicken facility that is also on this um, part of this project, but it will be funded with a combination of private gifts and uh, university funds. Are there any questions on this? That's all I have, Regent Takovich. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody on the committee have any questions on either of those projects? Otherwise, we will approve those by consent and take them to the full board. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, Register of University of Northern Iowa Capital Improvement Business Transactions. Michael. Good morning, Regent Takovich and committee members. Uh, the university has one item on our capital register today. It is the partial roof replacement on the iconic Unidome. Uh, it's just the fabric portion of the roof, which is the center portion as identified in the docket item. Uh, the remainder of the roof is still under warranty and under warranty through 2040. Um, that fabric was last replaced in 99 and it lasted 23 years. Uh, this particular fabric, we're moving into year 22. So we are approaching the useful life of that fabric. And so we're asking for permission to move forward with project planning. Uh, the next step would be to hire a design professional for the project. Uh, we're looking at using a pool of funds from uh, gift funding, the field house fund, general fund, and or athletics department. Uh, we haven't finalized a source of funding yet. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Any questions <clears throat> on that project? Okay, hearing none, well, those are approved. That is approved by consent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Register of Iowa School for the Deaf, Capital Improvement Business Transactions, Steve Gettle. Good morning, Eagle Dokovich, members of the committee, along with a docket item for approval of capital improvements to Long Hall. I have um, the following comments. Um, we're grateful to the board and the legislature who approved funding for the renovations to Long Hall. And, we, we understand that a project of this magnitude can't be undertaken without support 
and we appreciate the need that's been um, recognized there for these upgrades. Um, so over the past month, John Cool and our team have been meeting with the engineers from ISU and HDR Incorporated to get firm dates on a timeline for the project and consider what the school uh, needs to do so the project can move forward. Um, we will relocate all classrooms and offices from the main north-south section and, and the picture there on the docket item. Um, and uh, those classes, classrooms and offices will be um, moved uh, by June 30th, uh, uh, excuse me, by May, May 30th, because the contractors are gonna be, begin, begin work on June 30th. And we expect the completion date of June 30th uh, in 2022. Um, timeline will allow for the relocation of these classrooms and workspaces to temporary locations, primarily in LEED Multipurpose Center, Science Center, and the old gym that is in Long Hall, but those areas won't be impacted um, by the project. And then we'll also be using space in the girls' dorm and recently renovated space in the administration building for offices. Um, yeah, the primary project includes a new heating, cooling, ventilation system and upgrades to the heating system throughout the building, window and exterior door replacement, tuck pointing, and uh, upgrades to the fire detection and emergency notification system. Uh, there are some additional renovations related to ADA and fire code compliance. Uh, we look forward to the completion of the project knowing the students and staff are going to benefit from a more comfortable teaching and learning environment and an improved security system. And of course, the whole agency uh, benefits from the energy efficiencies that we're gonna realize through the project. Be happy to answer any questions, thank you. Questions for Steve on this project. <laughs> okay, hearing none, that is approved by consent. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have, uh, two leases and two easements. We will start out with the University of Iowa easement to the city of Coralville, David. Thank you, Regent Dokovich. Uh, the University of Iowa re requests approval to enter into an easement and right of way a, a conveyance agreement with the city of Coralville. And then separately, we have a standard utility easement with the city of Iowa City. The uh, Coralville uh, um, agreement is related to a residential development uh, that's occurring privately to the west of um, the Oakdale campus in, in an undeveloped part of our Oakdale campus. The developers need a, uh, a further access road as a secondary access for fire uh, access into uh, this new development. Um, the university's master plan, the city's master plan uh, have, have called for a road to be built in this, in this area. So the university's agreed to convey to the city of Coralville a 33 uh, foot standard roadway right away it'll be sort of uh, uh, east of the center line the developer uh, will convey uh, the, the 33 foot to the west of the center line um, for this road to be constructed at the developer's expense uh, we would also provide a standard 15 foot utility easement uh, for city and public and private unit um, utilities to run alongside the road um, so 15 feet back of curb. Um, there's no out-of-pocket expenses or cost to the university. This will be fully funded by uh, the developer. Um, upon completion, it'll be conveyed to the, the roadway will be conveyed to the city and be a dedicated um, city street. And the development, uh, I'm sorry, the easement with the city of Iowa City is a standard uh, storm sewer easement. Uh, this is off of Melrose Court, where the university has some of our cultural homes. There's continuous issues during heavy rains with, um, with both flooding and, and erosion. There's a, there's a deep ravine um, behind some of these homes and uh, a lot of washout. So the city's it's part of a roadway renovation project is, is going to be installing some new uh, relocated storm sewers, uh, part of which will cross university property. Again, no cost to the university at all uh, for for this project. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for David on those two easements. Okay, Thank hearing you. none, those are approved by consent. Thank you, David. Uh, moving on to Iowa State University and Pam Kane, we can start with the US cellular lease. 
Thank you, Regent Dokovich. Uh, Iowa State University requests approval of the master lease with US Cellular to install multiple small cell systems on campus and to delegate the authority to Iowa State to execute, execute specific site supplements in addition to the first 15. Um, US Cellular has identified a need to improve cell campus coverage and um, they identified 15 locations that can be expanded to more under this master lease. Uh, but each additional site must be agreed to by both parties, that's Iowa State and US Cellular. Uh, this new set of cell, small cell systems will improve the cell phone reception on campus. It'll provide higher data speeds as well as fewer drop calls. And it's all at no cost to Iowa State. Um, the additional benefits include new lights and light poles, which improve the lighting on campus. And US Cellular would, in addition, pay for the energy consumption and data service connections for each of these uh, small cell systems. And it is very similar to the Verizon agreement on campus that the board previously approved. I'd be happy to answer questions on that one. The second lease, okay. The second lease is with the Iowa State University Foundation. Um, we are requesting approval to delegate to the uh, board's executive director to execute a lease with the Iowa State University Foundation for property in the US Virgin Islands. Um, Iowa State has been operating an educational and service learning program called Earth on the island of St. John's in the Virgin Islands. On this lease, um, this lease property was private and um, it has buildings for teaching and meeting space, um, student and staff housing. It also has a garden and environmental demonstration areas. And um, the owner had desires to donate this property to ISU Foundation. And it's anticipated the legal transfer will be completed by June 30th of this summer. And so the foundation is willing to accept the property and to lease the property to Iowa State for $1,000 per year. And Iowa State would be responsible for the maintenance, utilities, and janitorial services for the property. Um, there's uh, discussions happening about property and liability insurance responsibility, and those will be mutually agreed on between Iowa State Foundation and the university. And the donor has also, um, a donor has also pledged through fiscal 2025 to facilitate those operational and programmatic use of the program, of the property. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Pam on, e on either one of those two leases? Pam, this I is on Iowa State sign at, uh, on St. John one time. I'm, I'm happy to know more about the project. Thank you. <clears throat> Pam, this is Michael. Does the facility at St. John uh, sufficient size to hold the properties and facilities committee meeting there? Uh, uh, I, uh, it, I think it would be yes. <laughs> Great question, uh, Michael. <laughs> yeah, particularly today's. Uh, absolutely. Was that a motion? Yeah. Second. Yeah. There we go. Third. Actually, we'll do that by consent, David. No. Okay. Hearing, hearing none, those are uh, approved by the committee for consent. That's all that I have on the agenda. Is there anything else that needs to come before the committee? Okay. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. So welcome everyone to the uh, meeting of the Investment and Finance Committee. Uh, this meeting is called to order. We have two agenda items. Uh, the first is uh, the minutes of our November 10th uh, meeting. And uh, so are there any questions or edits uh, that might need to be made to the minutes as written? Mr. Chairman, th this is Brad. I see a mistake I made on the, the header of the 
the fourth item. It should be reference calendar year 2021 and it references 2020. Apologize for that. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Any, uh, anything else? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll consider the minutes approved by uh, general consent. And agenda item number two is the investment and cash management report for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020. And uh, so I'll recognize uh, Dave Smith and Doug Ost uh, for their presentation. Thank you, Regent Barker. Good afternoon, everyone. I will share this screen. Looks like I'm not able to share the screen. There we go. Okay, so you know to start, uh, it's it's been a very exciting year in, in financial markets. This time a year ago, we were on the doorstep of one of the fastest and largest drops in equity markets, followed by massive levels of stimulus from central banks worldwide, that has led to an astonishing recovery in in equity markets and in, in fixed income markets, for that matter. We have been disciplined in our oversight and compliance with the investment policy. We have stayed aligned with our overall asset allocation goals. And because of that, we've been rewarded by a rising tide of equity markets driven by lower interest rates and a tremendous amount of, of, of stimulus. So as we always do, we'll start with an overview of the market environment that really allows us to understand key drivers in the three portfolios that are under our collective care operating portfolios, an operating portfolio with the higher, a slightly higher uh, return expectation, and of course the endowment uh, for both universities, which have very long-term growth goals. So, so to start, and in the next slide, please. And I think we're all well aware of sort of the political, uh, the political backdrop that's fueled at least a lot of headline activity. Uh, generally, it, it is looking back to the 1930s, uh, regardless of, of political Political headlines and political news markets have, have recovered reasonably well, but the key driver really has been uh, the vaccines, the stimulus that have supported and helped us get through COVID, and the lower interest rates that have fueled higher equity prices. The, the drop in interest rates have supported bond prices, but we, in thinking forward, we need to understand the implications for particularly fixed income. Uh, unemployment continues to come down from the heights of the COVID crisis, but it's still twice as, twice as high as where we were a year ago. We are at record low levels of employment uh, prior to the COVID crisis, and we're now we're hovering around 6.7%. And obviously, people going back to work in markets worldwide help stimulate recovery and perhaps lead to inflationary pressures that have not yet surfaced. Next slide, please. And one of the key drivers of overall interest rates is the Fed's appetite for its bond buying program. Uh, we can see that following the global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve increased the assets in its balance sheet to help support capital markets. Uh, that helped tremendously and the world slowly, or the US slowly recovered from the global financial crisis. In 2015, we started to see that balance sheet wind down. The Fed uh, slowed its bond buying uh, program it started, started to see some of those assets uh, mature, and as a result, interest rates increased. Interest rates went from about zero in 2015 to as high as 2.5%, only to come crashing down uh, this time a year ago as a way to support capital markets. Those low interest rates boosted bond prices, equity prices alike, and this portfolio has benefited from that, or these portfolios have benefited from that. Next slide, please. So where we see the benefit, especially in fixed income, if we look across the year column and then more specifically the three month column, core fixed income or broad market fixed income at the very top over the trailing 12 month period ending 1231, posted equity like returns, core bonds were up seven and a half percent. That's almost exactly what we would expect to achieve from public equity markets over the long term. Unfortunately, type that type of return from bonds are not sustainable. And what we've achieved over the course of the last month and three months, whether it's 10 basis points or 70 basis points is more emblematic of the bond market returns that we can expect from investment grade fixed income or US treasuries. However, as we scroll down and look at that second box in the three month column credit indices, whether it's high yield bonds or senior secured loans, that yield advantage offers return to uh, 
fixed income portfolios like the operating portfolio, we are being compensated from credit risk and we are earning a yield higher than we could otherwise earn from investment grade fixed income or US treasuries, underscores the key point of diversification within the fixed income portfolio and really how important credit is in terms of meeting our goal of return within the operating and diversified intermediate portfolio. Next slide, please. Just an illustration of the yield curve, we've already talked about the drop in interest rates as evidence from the green line in December of 2019 to the blue line of December 20 short term rates have dropped all the way to zero, but part of that phenomenon has, has illustrated a rising or a steepening yield curve. Uh, the yield curve was flat uh, basically this time a year ago, but now the outlook is at some point interest rates will increase, whether it's the Federal Reserve coming in and taking measures to curb uh, inflation down the road or just uh, a lower appetite for US treasuries, we are seeing a steepening yield curve that has implications with financial services sectors and makes and has helped fuel that recovery with an equity markets. Financial services have rebounded along with a host of other, other uh, cyclical sectors. Next slide, please. Again, to illustrate the merits and the benefits of having below investment grade credit in a portfolio, the first four lines, AAA through double or AAA through double or triple B, all represent uh, investment grade fixed income. And as we see credit markets rally, we see below investment grade, or as we see equity markets rally, we see below investment grade offering very attractive returns. And again, this is part of the benefit of having a diversified fixed income portfolio and having allocations to investment grade credit treasuries and below investment grade credit, including high yield and senior secured loans. Uh, next slide, please. U.S. equities, of course, have been a key driver and especially large, large cap growth fueled by heavy allocations to technology, in particular, the five names, uh, Alphabet or Google, Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, these are all names that have caught a, a, a tailwind and have really supported equity markets. However, the course of the last three or the last three months and the last month in particular, small cap stocks have rebounded and offered value to diversification across capitalization levels, uh, having large tech growth or large, uh, large cap tech and small cap in the portfolio even more recently has been beneficial to the overall portfolio. Next slide. And then finally, just to comment on volatility, I think it's very easy to become pre preoccupied with the headline noise, uh, the sharp downturns that occur frequently from equity markets. And just as a reminder to illustrate that point, the gold bars that we see across every calendar year dating back to 1990 represent the calendar year return for the S&P 500 large cap companies in the United States. The green diamond represents the magnitude or the most significant drawdown or downturn. And to illustrate illustrate this point in every year over the last 31 years, um, there has been a drawdown, some sell off in equity markets. Every other year, on average, we see a market correction, a sell off of 10% or more. Every decade or so, we see a bear market, and that's a sell off of 20% or more. But in general, uh, with the exception of six years out of the last 31, calendar year returns from the S&P 500 have been positive, and that's precisely why we have allocations to equities and we have heavier, higher allocations to equities within the long-term portfolio or the endowment. Next slide, please. Actually, if you can go back one slide, there you go. Uh, so Dave mentioned already the, the big reversal in leadership in the fourth quarter, uh, but just to illustrate it here, you can see in the uh, darker colored bars there, cyclical sectors like financials, uh, energy, industrials, materials, all performed very well in the fourth quarter. Those were the, the leaders for the quarter. Um, and then conversely for the, the year to date and the green bars, uh, you know, despite that large rally, uh, you know, technology was clearly the leader uh, for 2020 overall. Um, you can see energy was was by far the, the lowest performing sector, despite the big bounce back in the fourth quarter. Uh, if you go to the next slide, just looking at the disparity between growth and value, uh, you know, growth has had a decade long run of strong performance. And 2020's performance really pushed that long term performance to the levels really we haven't seen since, uh, you know, the dot com bubble and even uh, to a certain extent exceeding those levels. Um, you know, you can see the the Decent sized dip there at the end uh, of this chart, 
which is where the, the fourth quarter of 2020 is. And, and really that just represents the outperformance of value uh, in the fourth quarter, as you saw that reversal of trends um, really stemming around the vaccine and the stimulus news. If you look on the next slide uh, on page 12, looking at non-US equity markets, and here strategies have rebounded very substantially as well. Uh, you'll notice the broad market uh, in the non-US equity uh, actually outperformed the broad US equity markets for the fourth quarter. Um, you know, really on the developed market side, one of the biggest uh, contributors to performance was the weakening dollar, uh, which added about 7% to overall returns. And if you look uh, towards the, the middle and bottom of the page, you'll see that emerging markets and small cap um, both outperformed developed markets and large cap for the year, uh, somewhat echoing the, the performance, at least in the fourth quarter of the US markets. On the next slide, uh, you know, again, the, the trend of growth versus value was seen overseas as well. Um, you can see here with the, the recent uh, performance in 2020, uh, the, the performance of growth reached a two standard deviation or actually exceeded a two standard deviation mark uh, before dipping back down again in the fourth quarter as value outperformed for the quarter. If you move to the next slide, uh, just looking at the real estate market, and here, uh, real estate overall finished slightly positive. Again, there were definitely significant headwinds uh, at the beginning and middle of the years around pandemic related shutdowns. Uh, as you can imagine, industrial was the best performing area of the market. Uh, warehouses and, and research and development spaces all performed very well, uh, while retail was the worst performing part of the market as malls have really struggled again with the, the related shutdowns. And there's the trend overall to uh, a shift in more e-commerce uh, amongst consumers. On the next slide, we look at private equity markets. And here you can see the impact uh, of the pandemic uh, as it relates to transaction volume in the private markets. Uh, you know, typically when there is a disruption or an economic downturn, you do see transaction volume dip. Uh, you can see that during the dot-com bubble. You can see it during the financial crisis. Uh, and in 2020, you definitely did see a, a decline in transaction volume. Uh, but signs at this point point towards a pickup in activity uh, as we enter 2021. And then on page 16, as it relates to valuations, uh, you know, the, the public markets obviously have done extremely well, uh, and with that come very high valuations. Uh, and when you look at the private equity market on a relative basis, uh, it's very attractive relative to the multiples you're seeing in the public markets, uh, particularly in the mid and small buyout space. Uh, you can see you know, roughly a 50% discount here relative to the public markets. Uh, so a compelling relative valuation opportunity in the, in the private equity market. And then lastly, on the, the next page, on page 17, just a recap of performance for 2020. Uh, again, after that significant drop in the first quarter, if you look to the left-hand side of this page, public equity markets rallied back very significantly, ended up double digits for the second straight year. Uh, and overall, uh, risk assets did quite well for 2020. Uh, if you look to the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a lot of the asset classes that provided a lot of protection during the first quarter. Um, so income-focused asset classes that held up during that sell-off um, lagged during the last three quarters, uh, as you saw really that bounce back in risk assets. Um, just really overall emphasizes the importance of diversification uh, in, in the portfolios. And the reason that we highlight these asset classes, these are the asset classes that we are using within each of the portfolios, uh, portfolio types to manage risk and return outcomes. We think that these are going to be the most critical drivers of return and uh, volatility control. And while we see very healthy returns from equity markets, that tends to be uh, mean reverting. If you think back to 2018, this was almost a mirror, a mirror image of itself. Core bonds or core, I'm sorry, core real estate was the only asset class that performed well. Bonds were flat and equities were down. So we have a diversified portfolio that over the long term will allow us to achieve our uh, risk and return goals. Uh, so if we move into the portfolio, we can see just how these portfolio or just how these asset classes have impacted returns uh, over the long and short term time periods. Next slide, please. Actually, one more. So the, the three different portfolio types under our collective care, an operating portfolio in which both, uh, in which each university has invested a diversified intermediate portfolio for the University of Iowa, which has a slightly higher return goal. The operating portfolio is designed to have relatively low volatility and achieve a return of 3%. 
the diversified intermediate portfolio of 4%, and then the endowment portfolio has a, uh, uh, a much more aggressive uh, growth goal or return goal of around 7.5%. So this is a defensive portfolio. Accordingly, we have high allocations to fixed income and to liquidity allocations, which are designed to achieve some yield, but also prevent against or, or safeguard against dramatic market swings. So with the defensive portfolio on the next slide, we've been able to achieve or surpass our long-term investment goals of 3% by a significant margin. That's been help, helped by uh, healthy equity markets, credit markets. Over the shorter term time period, we have, we have trailed uh, on a relative basis, but the absolute, absolute results have been high. We have supported by, again, equity allocations, credit allocations. But over the long term, we are achieving the goals that we've set out to accomplish uh, by returning four and a half or over four and a half percent. Next slide, please. Both University of Iowa and Iowa State have uh, identical policy allocations or policy goals, a dedicated allocation of fixed income of 60% with liquidity of 20%, with smaller allocations to, to growth assets like U.S. equity, um, non-U.S. equity, and then real estate, which really is a diversifier. And as a result, uh, we, we stay very close to these policy goals. There can be some differences due attributable to cash flows, but generally speaking, we are able to accomplish the same results as evidenced on the next slide, where performance again is aligned with the benchmark over the trailing five years and just slightly underperforming over a one and three year period. But again, uh, the conservative posture has served us well and we've been able to accomplish the portfolio objective, uh, in this case of, of 3% uh, by, by a significant amount. Doug? If you, you move to the next slide, just looking at the University of Iowa, uh, the diversified intermediate term portfolio, uh, as David mentioned here, you're, you're looking at a slightly higher return profile, a little more risk in the portfolio. You can see that risk assets like US, non-US equity uh, have slightly higher allocations. Um, but at the end of the, the uh, year here, you can see overall in line with target allocations. Uh, if you move forward to the next slide, looking at performance, Again, this portfolio targets a 4% return. Uh, and you can see that in the quarter, it achieved a 5.4% return. So uh, it gives you a sense of how strong the equity and the credit markets have been. Uh, again, a 7.5% you know, return over the one year is above expectations and really attributable to the strong uh, equity and, and credit markets that we saw uh, during the last year. Uh, again, overall, uh, over the, the long term, well in excess of that 4% uh, return target. Uh, and ahead of that, that policy index. If you move forward to the next slide, page 25 has the University of Iowa endowment allocation. Uh, here again, the, that higher return target, higher weightings to risk assets uh, and the inclusion of private markets, uh, which you see towards the right-hand side of the page. Uh, again, the, the endowment uh, for the University of Iowa ended the year slightly overweight to private markets uh, with a corresponding underweight to real estate uh, and a slight underweight to fixed income. Uh, but by and large, uh, in line with, with targets uh, on an overall basis. On the next slide, looking at performance, uh, with that higher risk profile and a targeted higher return, you can see uh, you know, a return over 8% for the quarter net of fees. Uh, and then again, over the long term, you can see that 10% return, um, you know, a very strong, healthy return, both on an absolute and relative basis uh, over the long term. On page 27, uh, here we show the Iowa State Endowment and again, a slight overweight to private markets with a corresponding underweight to real estate, uh, but by and large, uh, roughly in line with the overall asset allocation targets. And then lastly, the performance. And again, uh, you know, similar results up over 8% for the quarter uh, on the next slide. And, and again, long-term, very healthy returns net of fees, uh, both on an absolute and a relative basis really driven by the strong uh, credit markets, strong equity markets, uh, and overall strong environment for, for private equity. We'll start there and that completes our report if there's any questions. Are there any questions? Uh, anyone? I just uh, wanted to uh, Kind of repeat a, a, a question that Terry Johnson uh, brought up in our pre-meeting discussion uh, that even though that I thought was important just to for you to repeat uh, here that to, even though there, there's a lot of uncertainty and change going on that there's 
there's really nothing in this portfolio that is particularly high risk or obviously troubled because of current trends and that it gives us the diversification that we need uh, and that your conclusion is that we should uh, basically stay the course. Uh, it, it, is, is that, do I have that right? Yes, sir. When we think about asset allocation for each portfolio, we recognize that each portfolio has unique risk and return goals. And we have uh, constructed portfolios with the underlying asset allocations based on our analysis, based on our research. And these asset allocations are designed to accommodate a wide variety of market circumstances, uh, as evidenced by what we've seen over the last five years with rising interest rates, falling interest rates, and a significant amount of volatility, the outcome over a five-year period and longer has been in line with our expectations, and we certainly expect that going forward. Great. Well, thank you. Um, any, other, uh, any other questions? All right. Well, any other business to come before the committee? Okay. If not, the Investment and Finance Committee is now adjourned. Thank you very much.